I, like many gamers, have sunk hundreds of hours into this year's smash hit, Elden Ring. It's great, but one bad habit I have is that when I play a game, I can't help but wonder how I'd go about building the main character in Skyrim. That's probably why I have literally thousands more hours in Skyrim than any other game in my library. It's a problem. But I decided to follow my bliss and share it with you lucky devils. Now, like Skyrim, Elden Ring is very open-ended in terms of character building and progression, so you could end up with a much different character than what you started with. So I'll be basing my Skyrim Astrologer build off of how that class starts off in Elden Ring and how I chose to play it during that playthrough. Also, while I'm currently over 100 hours into Elden Ring, I'm pretty sure I haven't seen nearly all the spells yet, and I'm equally sure that the spells I'm using aren't optimal. So, if you found other spells with better Skyrim counterparts, please let me know in the comments. I might learn something about Elden Ring, and I love talking about this stuff. Another thing I wanted to mention, with how moddable the creation engine is, it is possible to install mods that literally import equipment and mechanics directly from other games. This concept doesn't interest me as much, since there is little challenge and creativity involved, so I'll be building this class based on mods that I already have installed and ready to use from my existing main mod list. I'm treating this as kind of a build challenge on Legendary Difficulty. I want to see if I can make a build based on the Astrologer class viable on the hardest settings. And with that, let's see how I managed. The key mods used in this build are... Apocalypse, Magic of Skyrim. This adds some nice destruction spells, which you can also craft staves for, as well as some conjuration spells, which support Elden Ring's concept of spirit tuning to buff our summons. Ordinator, Perks of Skyrim. For all kinds of perks to support this build, including some useful destruction buffs, alchemy perks to help buff staves, resistances, and resource regeneration, and the Spell Scribe perk to help represent Elden Ring's Ashes of War enchanting system. Forgotten Magic Redone, which adds some summons that are pretty close to some of the Spirit Ash summons in Elden Ring. These summons are also upgradable, as they are via Spirit Tuning in that game. Hunterborn. This mod adds a bunch of new alchemical ingredients, which are useful for sure, but this is mainly here for the Mortar and Pestle item, which allows you to create potions anywhere, and also allow you to proc the Lab Skeever perk at any time. This helps mimic Elden Ring's Flask of Wondrous Physic, which I'll go over later. Honed Metal to help mimic Elden Ring's equipment upgrade system. I'll go over this later in the guide as well. In Elden Ring, there are no discrete choices for character race, at least in terms of mechanics. Therefore, I decided to choose Imperial for this build, as it's the least distinguishable of all the Elder Scrolls races. In retrospect, I might have chosen the Altmer for the enchantment buffs with Imperius, but hindsight tends to be 2020. Either way, I didn't find this choice to be all that consequential. The skills used for this class are Conjuration, Destruction, Enchanting, Block, One-Handed, and Alchemy. These skills were chosen to try to best mimic my playstyle from Elden Ring. Conjuration represents the spirit summoning mechanic, pretty straightforward application here which we'll explore some more in the spells section later. Destruction is a funky one. The astrologer mainly uses staves for ranged damage, so most of the perks from the destruction tree won't apply to staff casts. There are a few worth taking, and we'll talk about those later, however the number of casts you get per charge on your destruction stave scales directly with destruction level. Also, since staves do not progress skill levels, destruction levels are gained primarily through training and spell scribe triggers. Enchanting does a lot of the heavy lifting for this build. It has subtrees dedicated to staves and staff synergies, and it also allows us to enchant weapons and armor to mimic the Ashes of War enchanting system in Elden Ring. Finally, it also provides the spell scribe cast trigger to help represent some of the grander Ashes of War attacks. Block is important as the Astrologer's last line of defense against tenacious melee attackers and even some ranged archer and mage attacks. Since he does not wear armor, this is fairly necessary. One-handed is used mainly as a backup for when your staff runs out of charge, or for mage enemies that are stubborn with wards. For Ordinator, your melee attacks on their own end up being more effective than your staves, so you might want to make a significant effort to avoid using your sword in favor of your staff. Finally, I've added alchemy to this list to represent the various flasks that you can obtain and upgrade in Elden Ring. 
This will provide valuable healing potions, but also fortification potions that act as an equalizer against tough encounters. Especially useful since there isn't a ton of damage scaling for staves alone in either the destruction or enchanting trees, and not much synergy for a staff and shield playstyle. For the birth sign in Classic Classes and Birth Signs Reimagined, I chose the Mage, which gives you 30 points of additional magicka at the very beginning of your playthrough. This helps a lot with summons early on in the game. As far as standing stones go, I chose the Mage Stone early on. This helps destruction, conjuration, and enchanting to level faster. And in the late game, once you found all stones, it grants the ultimate power active ability, which greatly boosts spell effectiveness, including damage with destruction spells and those cast from a staff. However, it's a random roll whether the destruction buff is even offered, and you may be stuck with a boost to a skill that you don't even use. Later on in the playthrough, I switched to the Steed Stone. The added carry weight is nice, and after you've discovered all stones, you get unlimited access to a magical storage space. In Elden Ring, you also have access to an extra storage space when you are over encumbered. As far as attributes, for every five levels, I took one point in Magicka, three points in Health, and one point in Stamina. Since we are mainly using staves for destruction spells, we only need enough Magicka to cast the desired amount of summons before engaging with the enemy. So, I only ended up putting one point into Magicka for every five levels. You might want to invest a bit more heavily if you want to be able to cast more summons with the March of the Dead Conjuration perk, which scales with Magicka Pool. The relatively heavy investment in health is simply there to keep us alive as an unarmored mage that sometimes relies on sword and shield. I also put one point into Stamina every five levels to support blocking and dodge rolling if you have that mod installed. So for Conjuration perks, I chose Conjuration Mastery 1 and 2. This will help bring down the cost of your summons, saving attribute points for health. Since the Astrologer doesn't wear armor, a large health pool will be key to survival. I also took Edge of Oblivion. This will give you access to a second summon at the price of losing armor and magic resistance when no summons are present. This seems worth it to me as you should always enter battle with summons and respawn them as they die off. Finally, I took Packed Magic. This will help give your staves a little extra punch while your summons are close. Every little bit helps. And for Destruction, we'll start off with the Destruction Mastery perks 1 and 2. This will make it possible to dual cast Destruction spells for the Spell Scribe perk covered later on. This is also necessary to keep from spending too many attribute points on Magicka, saving them for health instead. You'll also want to take the Destruction Dual Casting perk, this perk is necessary for using Spell Scribe, which will be covered later on with the enchanting skill. I also took the Ionized Path perks 1 and 2. I decided to focus on Shock for this build as few enemies resist it, and it acts as a general magic element in this game. Therefore it tends to pack the most punch, and it most closely resembles the sorceries in Elden Ring. Following that logic, I took Elemental Specialization. Again, I chose Shock here, as I found no reason to use the other elements, and an extra 15% damage with our staves is a nice and much needed boost. Finally, I grabbed Show Them All. This perk is the last one in the subtree that affects staves, but I don't actually recommend taking it. The perk investment needed to get here just doesn't seem worth it for faster Magicka Drain. Eventually, this Magicka Drain will earn you a faster boost to damage, but again, it's not worth the extra perk investment to get here, in my opinion. But if you have extra perks burning a hole in your pocket, go ahead and grab it. Moving on to enchanting, I took both ranks of enchanting mastery. Stronger new enchantments for your gear, as well as more charges for your staves. Great utility early on in a playthrough. Next, I took staff channeler, uh, mainly for the enchanting experience in combat, though the reduction in charge drain is really great as well. You'll also want to grab Staff Recharge, which provides a passive recharge for your equipped staff great early on while destruction level is still low. I also took Gem Dust, which allows you to spend flawless gems for more powerful new enchantments on your gear. Simple and effective. Moving on, I also took Regalia, stronger new enchantments on non-armored pieces of gear, and Attunement, which strengthens all existing enchantments on your gear, including staves. You'll also want to grab Twin Enchantments, which lets you place two enchantments on each new piece of gear. 
and Arcane Nexus, which gives you stronger new enchantments, simple as that. Finally, I took the Spell Scribe perk and its subtree. This grants you a new power that allows you to hook up the currently dual casted spell to power attacks with your sword. This is the best replacement I could find for the Ashes of War enchantment system in Elden Ring. This won't provide any of the super impressive glowing enlarged Great Blade effects of that game, but hooking up a forgotten magic spell like Lightning Strike can be powerful and flashy, and it gets stronger the more you use it. Power Echoes simply lets you trigger Spellscribe one additional time before the cooldown starts. Moving on to Alchemy, you'll of course want to grab Alchemy Mastery ranks 1 and 2. New potions are more powerful, simple as that. The Advanced Lab perk allows you to choose an Alchemy Station to upgrade for more powerful crafted potions. Last but certainly not least, you'll want to grab Lab Skeever. After exiting an Alchemy Station, potions last 15 times longer and are 25% stronger. This ended up being one of the most important perks for me in the entire playthrough. In combination with Hunterborn's Mortar and Pestle, you can proc this perk anywhere at any time. Coupled with Destruction Potions, this gives our Destruction Staves the sorely needed boost that makes this build viable at Legendary difficulty. You can also take other beneficial potions at this time, but I'd recommend limiting them to one or two in order to keep things a bit more balanced and closer to the two effects that you get with Elden Ring's Flask of Wondrous Physic. I generally would take Fortify Destruction, Regenerate Health and Resist Magic Potions, though Fortify Block was a literal lifesaver early in the game when Block Skill was low. Next for One-Handed, I obviously took the One-Handed Mastery Perks 1 and 2. This provides a simple power boost to all One-Handed weapons. Good for when your staves are out of juice, or for when close quarters combat proves too much of an advantage to ignore, like enemy mages with stubborn wards. I also took Disciplined Fighter. The reduction in stamina spent on power attacks is great for Spell Scribe, allowing you to throw out more of them. Beyond that, I'd recommend not taking too many more perks in this tree. There are much better synergies with melee combat, and you may be tempted to focus on the sword and board playstyle, even lacking armor. The staff and shield playstyle really is the heart of this build, so I'd recommend doing your best to adhere to it and use your sword only in a pinch. And finally, moving on to Block, you'll obviously want to take the Block Mastery 1 and 2 perks. This allows you to simply block more damage with your shield. I also took the Deflect Arrows perk, which allows you to use your shield to more effectively block arrows fired at you, allowing you an opportunity to counterattack either at range or in close. I also took Dominion. Hit detection and character direction can feel a little wonky, so having a blanket damage reduction while your shield is up is a wise insurance policy to take. I also took Block Runner. In Elden Ring, having your shield up does not slow you down nearly as much as it does in Skyrim, so this perk helps you stay mobile and defensive at the same time. Finally, I also did take Apocalypse Proof 1 and 2. Timed blocks will nullify damage of fire, frost, and shock effects. This is very handy before you obtain Spellbreaker. Also, in Elden Ring, shields are generally as effective at blocking physical damage as they are magical damage. Okay, moving on to gear, let's take a look at staves. The first staff I grabbed was the staff of Yurik Galderson, which is easily obtainable early in the game. It does damage to both health and magicka, and is a good general purpose staff for the early game when staves can be hard to come by. Next up was the Staff of Magnus. This one's obtained later on in the college questline, but is another statically placed staff that you can count on. With Zim's Immersive Artifacts, it's an absolute laser cannon. The vanilla version is also decent with a unique Absorb Magicka and Health effect. Once you unlock the Staff Enchanter by doing Neloth's quest in Solstheim, you can start crafting better and more endgame staves. Namely, the Staff of Thunderbolts, which is a good mid-level staff for general purpose. The spell hits pretty much instantly, so it's easy to hit moving targets with and does a fair amount of damage that scales much better with Fortify Destruction Potions. I also ended up making a staff of Electrospheres. This became my endgame staff for general purpose use. It looks and acts much like the Gravity Well Sorcery in Elden Ring, which I used for most of the rank and file enemies. Great damage for general use, especially when buffed with a destruction potion. The only drawback is a fairly slow projectile speed, but at mid-range this usually wasn't an issue. You may also want to whip up a staff of scattershocks. If you're more the spray and pray type, this concentration staff might be for you. 
good damage, and at destruction level 100, you get to cast it for free. It acts like the Crystal Barrage Sorcery in Elden Ring. All you need to craft a staff is the desired spell, an unenchanted destruction staff, which you can purchase from Neloth, and a number of heartstones depending on the strength of the spell. Heartstones can be mined from heartstone deposits found scattered about Solstheim. Next up is the shield, and for this one you'll want to get Spellbreaker as soon as you can. In Elden Ring, shields are equally effective against physical and magical attacks. While you can block magic with a timed block via the Apocalypse Proof perk, Spellbreaker is the only way you can truly mimic Elden Ring's magic blocking mechanic. Zim's immersive artifact speeds up the ward effect on the shield and makes it temperable. Moving on to self-enchanted items, let's look at robes first. I went simply with this one and just took the Fortify Destruction enchantment for more charges on your staves, and I also took the Fortify Conjuration enchantment which makes it easier to cast summons early in the game. And for the hood, I used the exact same enchantments for the same reasons. On the gloves, I used Fortify One-Handed and Fortify Block, just to shore up melee defense and offense just for when your ranged game eventually does fail. On the boots, I went again with Fortify One-Handed, but I also applied the Fortify Movement Speed enchantment from Summer Mist Enchantments of Skyrim. On the ring, I applied the Resist Fire enchantment along with the Resist Magic enchantment. And on the amulet, I had Resist Frost and Resist Magic. The reason why I focused on Fire and Frost resistance is for the Dragon Breath attacks, and also we'll be applying some Shock resistance with another item. And that final item in our endgame loadout is Zakrisos, which is a Dragon Priest mask that can be obtained by killing the priest of the same name at the end of the Ravenrock Mine dungeon crawl in Solstheim. It provides 50% resistance to shock and a nice 25% boost to shock effect damage, which also applies to staves. I used the Warmonger's Armory mod to attach this to my belt instead of wearing it on my face for aesthetic reasons. You'll also want to make sure you have some good alchemy gear. So I made sure to have a set of gloves, circlet, necklace, and ring all enchanted with a strong fortify alchemy effect. Strong fortification potions are essential to this build. You'll also want to grab yourself a Mortar and Pestle. This is a very important item provided by the Hunterborn mod and can be crafted from animal bones. Using this item allows you to create potions anywhere in the world. It also counts as an alchemy station for the Lab Skeever perk in Ordinator. So any potions you take within 20 seconds after using this item will last 15 times longer and be 25% stronger. This allows you to buff up greatly before an encounter, and this is the key piece in making this build viable at Legendary Difficulty. This acts as the Flask of Wondrous Physic in Elden Ring. And now for a quick word about Honed Metal. This mod can be configured to closely match the upgrade system in Elden Ring. By disabling NPCs have materials and NPCs have rare materials, the ability to upgrade weapons and armor becomes tied directly to the materials you are able to procure, just like in Elden Ring. You'll want to set crafting time to zero and disable courier notifications so that upgrades are instant and the couriers will not needlessly harass you for upgrades that are already done. Okay, so let's talk about spells. First up is Conjuration. I got the most use out of the Death Guard summon from the Forgotten Magic Redone mod, which summons a large skeletal warrior which can be upgraded through use. This summon closely resembles the Skeletal Militiamen Ashes in Elden Ring, and is an overall fantastic minion to summon, especially once they're upgraded. It was a mainstay of mine in Elden Ring, and Death Guard is a mainstay for me in Skyrim. Without the Forgotten Magic Redone mod, the Wrathman summon, which can be found in the Soul Cairn, is a great substitute. It's a fairly strong minion and resembles the Skeletal Militia Men Ashes fairly closely. Another spell from the Forgotten Magic Redone mod, Wolfpack summons three wolves, also upgradable. These very closely resemble the Lone Wolf Ashes from Elden Ring. These wolves are great at sowing chaos on the battlefield as they are quick and tend to zoom around quite a bit as your enemies chase them about. A vanilla substitute for Wolf Pack would be the low level Familiar. Odin makes these guys stronger, but at higher levels they just won't last long enough to be very useful. Once you level up a bit, I'd suggest just moving on to the Wrathman summon instead. Also found in the Soul Cairn, Arvac is a summonable arcane horse, much like Torrent in Elden Ring. 
Sadly, Arvac doesn't handle nearly as well as Torrent, but he can help you get around a little faster and also to traverse mountainous terrain a little better. This last one doesn't follow a concept from Elden Ring, but is extremely useful anyway. Soul Cloak allows you to bind souls to fill soul gems in an area of effect around the caster. I hooked this up to Okado's recital so that it was activated upon entering combat, and this kept me stocked with filled soul gems that could be used to recharge staves and also to enchant gear. Two very important mechanics for this build. Moving on, there are four destruction spells to seek out for the express purpose of building staves. These are Thunderbolt, Electrosphere, Scattershock. These staff effects were all discussed previously in the gear section, so go back and check that out if you need a refresher. Lightning Strike is a forgotten magic redone spell that I hooked up to the Spellscribe Ordinator perk ability in order to mimic the Carrion Greatsword Ashes of War effect from Elden Ring. It doesn't really look super close to the original, but it kind of serves the same purpose. It provides a powerful magical effect that can be charged up from a weapon attack. The spell can be upgraded like the other spells from this amazing mod. And as far as black books go, you'll want to seek out Companion's Insight from the Winds of Change book. This black book can be found at the end of the Ravenrock Mine Dungeon Crawl, which is convenient since you'll already be there for the Zakrisos Mask anyway. At the end of the Apocrypha Jaunt, you can choose the Companion's Insight Boon, which removes friendly fire damage from your followers and minions. Elden Ring does not allow you to harm your spirit summons, and this allows you to spam area of effect spells without having to worry much about your minions. In my mind, the Astrologer was an Imperial Battle Mage trained in the Battle Spire. His passion did not lie with the Empire or the Legion, however, but with the knowledge this training and the Battle Spire library could bring to him. His motivations are mainly academic, while his mastery of war magic is more a means to an end of gaining knowledge. To connect this roleplay to the Elden Ring world, my Astrologer became obsessed with his own theory regarding Soul Gems what they were, what powered them, and their effect on the life forms they're bound to. This theory is that the soul itself is not trapped in the soul gem, but the kinetic life force left over by the life form when it dies. The soul itself goes elsewhere depending on the entities tied to or entitled to it. The leftover energy is what the astrologer called the glint, and what most know as soul gems he called glint stones. These glint stones would need to act as a conduit between all realms since it would need to catch latent energies upon the soul's exit to any number of planes upon its exit from Mundus. So he theorized these stones to be fallen from Aetherius. In Elden Ring, glint stones are fallen stars that allow mages of that world to harness magical energies into spells. I think this explanation ties both worlds together quite well and gives the astrologer some motivation during the playthrough. He'd be obsessed with proving or disproving his theory, and so would be extremely interested in Azura's questline, the star itself, and Malin Varen's research on the artifact. He'd also be very interested in the Soul Cairn, and would want to explore every inch of that place, learning as much as he could about it. Any books, quests, spells, or enchantments on the matter of enchanting, or soul binding would be of utmost importance to this character, so let that guide your roleplay. This build and playstyle tend to be fairly basic. Blast enemies from afar with your staff and block them with your shield and hack them with your sword if they get too close for comfort. However, we still can do some fun combos with it. The first combo is one I've mentioned previously. I call it the Flask of Wondrous Physic. Basically, you'll want to activate your handy portable mortar and pestle to proc the Lab Skeever perk and then take a few fortification and regeneration potions to massively buff your damage output and survivability for any enemy encounter. I found it was more fun and balanced to use only two or three buff potions instead of boosting every aspect of gameplay and basically playing on easy mode. I'd always use a strong fortify destruction potion, along with resist magic if I'd be facing enemy mages or dragons, and fortify health or regenerate stamina based on what I felt were my needs for each encounter. The second combo I came up with is what I called Spirit Tuning. In Elden Ring, Spirit Tuning is the ancient art of strengthening your bound spirit summons in various ways. I implemented this in Skyrim by using the fantastic Power of the Master spell from Apocalypse to apply the Lightning Cloak spell and the Shocking Strike spell from Odin to all my summons. 
This buffs up all minions with both Area of Effect and Melee Shock Damage. Not a one-to-one -one implementation of the Elden Ring mechanic, but roughly similar and cool nonetheless. And that does it for yet another build video. I hope you enjoyed the new crossover build challenge where I implement ideas from other games. I had a ton of fun with it, and I do plan to do more with other games. Scorpion from Mortal Kombat, anyone? Anyway, let me know what you think, and if you enjoyed this video or found it useful, please do like and subscribe as it helps the channel out a lot and lets me know what kind of content folks like most. Until next time, take care.